This episode is brought to you by Bulletproof Script Coverage, where screenwriters go to get their scripts read by top Hollywood professionals. Learn more at CoverMyScreenplay.com. I'd like to welcome to the show, Julian Huckster. How are you doing? Hey, I'm good. Thanks. Nice to be here. Thank you so much for, uh, for being on the show. I, uh, I, I, uh, I wanted to have you on the show to talk about your book, uh, The Creative Screenwriter, 12 Rules to Follow and Break to Unlock Your Screenwriting Potential. And like I, I've said so many times before, I love bringing on different perspectives on the craft because at the end of the day, we're all going towards the same place, a good story. And how you get there could be one person's way, could be another person's way, could be a million different ways. And I always like to expose the audience to as many different ideas because you never know what will click with the right with the right writer. Would you agree? Uh, completely. I mean, I think, you know, I teach screenwriting at San Francisco State. We have a number of people who teach screenwriting and they're all really good. But, you know, if you're a student, you want the person not only who knows what they're talking about, but who you kind of click with. Um, and sometimes that's me. Sometimes it's very much not me. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, and that's fair. Uh, you know, there'll be people who don't like my accent, don't like my beard, don't like the fact that I'm an old fat white guy, all these good things. Um, and yet, hopefully, there'll be others who will find that I have something of value to offer. So, yeah. I mean, to be fair, I think the accent really adds credibility uh, to your teaching <laughs> as an American. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tell you what, when I have a nine o'clock lecture start, I reckon it gives me 20 minutes to sort of wake up and for the coffee to begin to percolate inside me before, uh, you know, they're really listening to what I'm saying. And they're kind of in that, oh, my God, his accent's so cute, but in, in an American accent. Um, you know, so, so uh, yeah, I count that as an advantage. Yeah. <laughs> no question. Uh, so how did you get into the business? Well, I went to film school. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I went to UCLA many, many years ago. And, um, and then uh, I, I really discovered a love of teaching and I went back to England and um, got a job part-time teaching at a university and then that became full-time and then I began to run departments and, and on it went. And uh, so I've really been in education for a very long time and in that time I've been working as an independent filmmaker, I've made some documentary features, done some rewrites on uh, um, you know, um, uh, indie, indie uh, features. Uh, and so on and so on. But also I've been writing and working on more scholarly work. So the history of screenwriting and um, the state of the industry and so on and so on. Uh, so I, I, I kind of straddle two camps. I, I'm partly a screenwriter, partly a, a, you know, a story consultant, but I also uh, research, write and teach uh, um, in, in film studies. I, out of curiosity, you talked about the history of screenwriting. I, I actually have never had that conversation with anybody. What is the history of screenwriting? Like, I know, like when when Edison started with his camera, you know, they were just kind of like doing short little bits. But like, at right. what point was there a screen? Well, we would what would be considered any sort of guidance as far as a story is concerned, and then what we would know as a screenplay today. Well, I mean, I think very early. There were what you would call scenario writers, and indeed, even before 1920, there were people who were writing books like like what we're talking about today. You know, how to write a screenplay or or a scenario. Um, there were people who were pitching ideas for short comedy movies and you know concepts as opposed to fully drafted scripts. And that comes a bit later. That comes more in the uh, as we're approaching the classical Hollywood period, perhaps. Um, but you know, Griffith was making features in the in the teens. You know, when we can whatever we say about them, they're they're, they're very very important. And people were writing some form of a screenplay, some form of a scenario from almost from the word go. And so so when so in the teens, you know, did um, what was that big epic film that he did? Not Birth of a Nation, but the other one. Intolerance. Intolerance. Did Intolerance have a screenplay? As no, I don't have. I'm sorry. Yeah, did they? I, I actually don't have a specific answer to that. I I, I don't recall. But um, uh, I think um, what you have to kind of understand is that you know this is a period where everyone is kind of learning what it means to make films. Right. And there are different versions of story that are going around. You know, we, we don't come to the, uh, um, uh, the the sort of the modern screenplay, uh, uh, you know, fully formed. Uh, even in the even in the classical period, you have a range of different formats. And of course, you know, until really into the 40s and, and 50s, screenplays were lists of shots uh, with mm. time. They weren't. Um, they weren't. Or very. They weren't typically uh, um, broken by scene. They were broken by shot. Um, and scene. Um, so, you know, these formats have developed over time and the formats also have developed according to the role of the screenwriter in the process. 
Um, so you know, in the 50s, um, when you move after you know, the Paramount Consent Decree, after the, uh, uh, the studios had to di divest some of their um, uh, um, divisions, uh, and after they basically sort of said goodbye to having buildings full of in-house screenwriters, when screenwriters became in, uh, independent or semi-independent and freelance, you know, one of the things that changes is the way that you tell a story on the page, a screen story on the page. And, you know, you begin to tell a screen story to be read because the reading is part of the gatekeeping as to whether or not you're going to get your, your, your story sold. Um, and, you know, before, you know, you go and you'd pitch to the producer, you'd pitch to the, the, the studio as a writer, you know, within their, their writing department. After, after we get into the freelance paradigm, well, you have to tell a story a different way. You can't just be, be having been given a pitch and, and you know, you're writing out a list of shots. It doesn't quite work that way. I'm simplifying, of course. But, you know. Right. So, so basically, uh, you know, when they were in the studio system, it was more of like a, a mechanical document of like shot, 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 where afterwards you had to become a little bit more of a crafts, artistic right. craftsman or woman to kind of sell the idea a little bit better. I think so. That, that sense of, on, of sort of entrepreneurialism, entrepreneurship, I don't which is the word, anyway, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's something that I think has always been part of, of writer's shtick. They have to be able to sell their ideas, but it becomes more and more important, I think. Uh, I, I and also, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. No, I, and, and I think, yeah, uh, um, uh, you know, writers learn that their style is their, their sales pitch as much as whether you can do a um, you know an elevator pitch in 20 seconds and get get the the the, the, the producer to you know like what you what you're selling uh, because the, the whole relationship between writers and studios changes and the whole way in which writers interface with studios or writers agents interface with studios and the idea of kind of you know uh, um, story readers who who sit as the gatekeepers you know between the writer and and the studio you know that becomes more and more important for writers to deal with and engage with you know from the 50s 60s 70s onwards um you know and that sense of the development of coverage and how coverage is incredibly important uh, not only for the script in hand but for your reputation within an organization and so on you know who will look back and see well what what coverage did you get last time you submitted to us and so on and so on and then and then so when you hear of a of a, of a studio or an agency signing an, a, a writer based on their voice uh, mm -hmm. even though that script that they might have submitted will never in a million years get produced but they look at it as a voice that is their style that is their signature yeah. in the marketplace yeah to, to misquote the coins uh, you know that, that's their barton think feeling right i mean that that's mm -hmm. exactly uh what you want <laughs> or what or what you just say they want right it is, sure. is uh yeah we can discuss the the realities but uh you know is is somebody who has a unique voice and you know we've got we've moved beyond in the in the um um, the tentpole era, such as you know, we can call it that, we sort of moved beyond the, t the, the time in which writers write specs with the expectation of selling the spec, um, and now it's the expectation of selling themselves, uh, as you as you indicated. Or at least right. more, so. uh, specs are still being bought, but but the you know the, the market is is way down from where it was in the eighties and nineties. You know? Oh God, yeah. I mean, I I, I love talking to. Sometimes I I get the the pleasure of speaking to some of those those uh, screenwriters at when they were like getting three million dollars a script. Two million dollars right. a trip. Five, I mean, what Esther House? I mean, Jesus. Yeah. I mean, he. I mean, he. I think he made. I think what was the? I think twenty or twenty-five million on scripts that never got produced. Yeah. <laughs> like and, it's and, insanity. And Shane Black is the other obvious example. Yeah. yeah. yeah sure. It was an insane time, and but a lot of screenwriters still think today that that's a thing, where it does happen, but it's rare. It's much rarer. I mean, it's it's. I, I was researching a book a couple of years ago, and I, I'm trying to remember who actually. Was it John August? I can't remember. I can't remember who it was. Someone made made the really good comment that now it's A-list and new guys. That there there really isn't a, a kind of uh, uh, market for sort of the journeyman screen screenwriter. Right. They, what you have, I mean, again, I'm simplifying, of course. Sure. But what, but what you have now is you have A-list guys who are going to who have their own relationships and, and are going to you know maybe have. Uh, uh, you know, first looks or whatever, but but are basically going to typically be asked to do rewrites, um, and then you have the new guys who are cheap and get the one step deal and then get fired so that you can uh, you know afford the the A list uh, um, writer to come in for a lower rate, a rewrite rate, and then rewrite the uh, the new guy's script. That's more the pattern than the idea that there are screenwriters who are you know able to to maintain a living that uh, um, in in the way that was the case. 
two decades ago. It's um, a lot. It's a lot tougher to become not only become a screenwriter, but to make a living as a screenwriter because the, the studios are not making as many movies as they used to. All the movies that they are making are based off of IP or yeah. or, or existing comic books or whatever that they, they're dealing with. So the, the the market for independent ideas are basically regulated to the independents or the mini majors, and even mm-hmm. then they're looking for IP as well. No one's dumping a hundred million into a into a spec script unless there's a massive actor, massive director, massive producers attached. Right, and this is one of the reasons. I mean, you're absolutely right. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why, when I'm teaching screenwriting, uh, you know, at my uh, college, uh, that we're developing classes and we're developing competences in asking students to think beyond the screenplay, and to think about, you know, what do you need to do in this convergent world, um, in order to become visible to Hollywood. And it's partly, you know, you can write a screenplay and you can show it to agents and you can win competitions and you can do all the, all, the, all these things, but even so, Hollywood is not interested unless there's an IP with some track record typically behind it. Or so audience. About, or audience attached. About, yeah. How do you go about getting that track record? Well, maybe you write a novel. Maybe you do something online with a, you know, an online comic. Who knows? Maybe you do your own independent comic book. Maybe, maybe you, maybe you, maybe you, maybe you, maybe you. So, you know, one of the things that I think that we have to do as educators, and here I'm talking as an educator, you know, is to think about how do you prepare students to be what I loosely call screenwriter 2.0, right? Because if you think of screenwriter 1.0, that's you know the the person who, I and mean, they may also have been a journalist or a novelist or something else in their time, but basically the person who you know wrote movies. Um, that was their career. They did as well as they did, but that was kind of what they did. And every now and again, maybe they they did something else. Whereas nowadays, I think that for the young writers coming up. The screenwriter 2.0 model is the screenwriter who is also thinking about all these other media, all these other convergent media, all these other ways of beginning to get an idea out there, particularly if they want to work in, you know, uh, um, in Hollywood, as we might still define Hollywood. Um, and it's and it, the, 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 the twin track, right? If it's my IP, I want I need to get it some kind of audience. If it's uh, uh, my spec, well, my spec no longer is what I'm selling. I'm selling myself, as you say, uh, because, you know, what we want if we're a studio is someone who can, um, you know, write the next IP-based movie for us. Exactly. And 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 I've, you know, I've seen a lot of success with podcasts, like, you know, yes. uh, different podcasts that people are writing, story-based podcasts, narrative podcasts that turn get, that get picked up, gets, they get optioned. Uh, and and obviously, com- independent comic books, novels. I've seen a lot of screenwriters create novels off of their screenplays and sell them, and then get optioned the book <laughs> when when their screenplay was rejected. Yep. That they will option the book because it becomes a yep. bestseller, or even if it doesn't become a bestseller, even if it has some sort of success. For the for the for the studios, a lot of times they just feel more comfortable. Because it covers their ass a bit more. <laughs> but as you know, this, I mean, it's a, it, precisely, it's a fear-driven media, right? Particularly when you're uh, an executive at a, a big studio. Um, and because the, the, there aren't the development budgets that there were anymore. I, I mean, it's, you know, the upside, I guess, is that if you if you do sell a spec, it's much more likely to actually get produced uh, now than it was in the in the 80s, right? Where, mm-hmm. where it's like one, one in 20 now, it's like one in three or four or five, and, and maybe out of date with those numbers. But you're much less likely to actually sell that script in the first place. I mean, so is that a trade-off you want? I don't know. Yeah, it's 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 uh, it's a new world for for writers as well as filmmakers. You oh, we have to be thinking of multiple revenue streams, other ways to make money, other ways to to maintain your 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 you know your craft, but your career. And mm-hmm. I've seen film, I've seen screenwriters who write those novels, and they generate money mm-hmm. automatically from self self publishing their own stuff. Every month, there's money coming in keeping the, the lights on while they're chasing the screenwriting dream exactly. and getting assignments or selling a script or something like that. But it's those writers who are like making a living and that could be blogging, that could be um, that could be podcasting, that could be a, a teaching, that could be a million different revenue streams that you can create as a screenwriter. You're absolutely right. I mean, this is why I developed a class for SF State in uh, um, creating story worlds, right? Which is about developing an IP and, and thinking about how that IP might work. Yes, by all means as a feature film, but also, you know, as a, anything from a TV show to a comic book to a, uh, a blog. Yeah. Um, uh, 
Uh, but this is exactly correct. I'm, I'm, I think we're on the same page with them. Absolutely. Now, you've been working with screenwriters for a long time. What is the biggest mistake you see first-time screenwriters make? Uh, ooh, good question. <laughs> there are many. Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, I mean, I, I'm lucky that I work with very inexperienced screenwriters, people who often don't have the, the, the confidence that they can actually do the thing literally functionally, let alone sell anything. Um, and you know, my, my number one job, I think, and I think I'm coming around to answering your question here. Um, my number one job, I think, is to actually give them the confidence that they can do it. Now, maybe that comes from you know the people who I'm seeing, you know, who I think you know need that sense that somebody's taking their their work seriously, is going to engage with it seriously, is going to give them you know hard but fair feedback, but on the basis of encouraging them to, to move forward and finish a first draft. And I think one of the things that that, that people get wrong is the idea that it's fine to, you know, quit halfway through and start another project. And, you know, I, I think that one of the most important things, if you're a young screenwriter or a, or a screenwriter just starting out, is finish your draft. And the, the, the screenplay itself might be garbage, right? And I've written, you know, uh, hold my own hand up here. Of course, I've written bad screenplays. Some of them are on the shelf over there, and I will never look at them again. Uh, but, and no one else will ever either. But that sense in which once you've done it once, however bad you think the outcome is. And, you know, you know, you might come back to it in five years and actually find something that's, that's interesting and you want to develop further. But however bad the outcome is, you know you can do it. And then the second one is easier. It's not easy, but it's easier. Um, uh, because, you know, you've done an extraordinarily difficult thing. And then when I think about, you know, what I do uh, um, as an educator, you know, I'm asking 18, 19, 20-year-olds um, to write a feature a feature screenplay. That's an incredibly difficult thing to do. It is. Uh, at any age. Um, and obviously there are some uh, you know, writers who come to us and they're, they're wonderfully prepared and advanced and they, I wouldn't say breathe <laughs> through it, you know, they, they, they find it less, less difficult. But there are a lot of kids who come, you know, with very little confidence in their own abilities um, and with lots of, uh, you know, good reasons why, uh, um, you know, writing is something that, that doesn't come naturally. Um, and, you know, the more they do it and the more they engage with the process, the, the better they get. Um, so it's, it's, like building a t it's like building a table. Like you build the first table you build, it's going to be pretty bad, I'm sure. And then the second table will get better, the third table will get better, right. and so on and so forth. And that's some of the best advice I've ever heard from, um, from screenwriters that I've spoken to is like, write, write, write. Mm -hmm. Just keep writing. I don't care if it's bad. Just write. I mean, yeah. I mean, the, the kind of part two of that is write every day. Mm -hmm. uh, do something that, in the, that relates to writing every day. It can be actively thinking about stuff and taking notes. It can be, you know, going to a location and seeing if it inspires you because you think it might in, it be of interest in your script. It can be anything. But if you feel like you're doing something that r relates to your writing every day, then it becomes part of your life. And it isn't the thing that sits there going, ha you haven't done me today, you know, um, and then becomes kind of the 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 unspoken you can't do it that sits behind you you know you right. you find ways of engaging in the writing process engaging in the the creative story thinking process every day and you know it's it's one of those you know take care of the pennies and the pounds or the dollars will take take care of the i well, get my currency right get take care of the cents and the dollars will take care of themselves right uh, exactly and and, the, and it's like they say you know you tell the muse that you're going to be here every day she shows up every once in a while but if okay. you're not there she might you might, you might miss her yeah yeah that's nice i like that. i'm stealing <laughs> steal it i stole it from somebody so yes please well this is what writers do right yeah. but, well of course and that's another thing we let's just this dismiss all of this thing like oh i can't you can't steal from everyone steals from everybody every director oh. steals from every director from the first person who made a two shot it's been stolen by Martin Scorsese and everybody is stolen from Martin and everyone's and, and Spielberg stole from Kurosawa and Coppola stole. I mean, it, it's and, 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 and the good ones admit it, right? The good ones are oh. like, yes, of course this was my influence, but I tried to do something with it, you know? Right. I, I guess the cliche exactly. is, you know, the, uh, um, bad writers steal, good writers are influenced. You know, I mean, this is, you know, no, good, bar, no, good, good, bar, good writers borrow, great writers steal. There you go. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, we'll go with that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly and it's but it's just so truth but like i remember when tarantino showed up everybody tried to be quentin yeah. and you can't like he's such a unique voice in the craft there's literally he's a once in a generation writer um and and let alone writer period let alone screenwriter there's just so many things going on 
the complexities of what he's writing and how he's writing and how he's delivering it. You can't, and they trust me, if you remember the 90s when, when Pulp Fiction came out, how many Pulp Fiction ripoffs came out and none of them were anything close. But, but also he had an encyclopedic knowledge. Oh, of it's insanity. All kinds of cinema that, that you wouldn't even think about, you know. Uh, absolutely. And when I was in film school, it was Shane Black, right? It was oh, yeah. uh, Lethal Weapon. Lethal Weapon came out. Oh. Everyone was reading that screenplay. The Shane Blackisms, you know, the kind of idiosyncratic way in which he wrote. Everyone was copying that. And it was, uh, you know, it was stupid. Um, you you can't. Find in films, yeah. yes. But you, there's no substitute for having your own voice. And that's the thing. And I think a lot of times people start um, as a writer, at least I've done it. And I know of a lot of other writers who's told me the same thing is they'll start trying to copy someone else in their style. But mm -hmm. then as you go through the process, your voice comes out through it. Uh, and that ha I think that happens with all writers. I think I, yeah. every writer who ever read something is influenced by, I mean, how many people have been influenced by Shakespeare? How many people have been influenced by Hemingway uh, right. or Dickens? And then you start to start down their road and then all of a sudden it becomes your thing. But exactly. you got you got to kind of like work out the thing. I think it was, I forgot who it was. It was a famous musician who said that when you start writing songs, it's like turning the faucet of a, of a, of a bathtub and the first stuff that comes out is sludge. It's just <laughs> deep, muddy sludge. Uh -huh. But as you keep letting it run, it starts to clear up and clear up and clear up until the point where it's crystal clear and ah, now I can start writing. So you got to get those bad drafts out as fast as possible. Could not agree more. Uh, I, I, I think, you know, the other way of looking at it, and this is with my, my sort of scholarly hat on, is the idea that, you know, all media texts are intertexts, right? Mm -hmm. um, they are a combination of things that you know that you're being influenced by and things that you, you have no idea, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's like the cliche, write what you know. Well, of course you're going to write what you know. What, what else can you do? Uh, and that's partly a conscious process. It's part, partly thinking, well, I want to be in the style of X. Uh, and that's partly, you know, you are the accretion of experience and and neuroses that you are, and so that's somehow going to manifest in in, in how you write. Um, yeah, I mean, I, it's just another way of saying what you said, but you know, yeah, I, I agree with you 100. percent Now, I, one thing that a lot of people, a lot of writers specifically, I've heard say that structure is too formulaic, that it's going to make it. You know, I, I'm not going to just be a formula guy or gal and. I need to be free and free flowing in my ideas. I can't be boxed in by structure. What would you have to say about that? Uh, it's a great question and it's a huge topic. Mm -hmm. I mean, to one extent, I think it depends on who you're writing for, right? Uh, you know, if you're making your own micro budget movie, you can do whatever the, whatever the hell, and I'm not sure what our, what our uh, profanity filter is here, but <laughs> what, whatever the hell you want, right? Sure. Um, uh, but you know, if you're writing uh, um, with a particular market in mind, then you have to be professional about it. Um, and it, there are many different versions of it in, in between kind of, you know, formula and complete anarchic freedom. Um, I think for me, I look at it this way, um, that understanding how most movies, stories, most relatively mainstream movie stories are told is a very, very powerful tool because that gives you a set of questions that you can ask yourself when you're getting to a certain point and you're not quite sure what to do or how to do it, you can go, well, all right, well, what do most movies do at this point? And then you can assess what you're trying to do. So for me, that's where I think formula or, or structural paradigms, structural models are useful because they give you a piñata. They give you a way of, of disciplining your thinking and a way of cutting through and asking the real questions as opposed to the what if generalized questions. Um, but yeah, I mean, all, all models uh, and really, frankly, most of, most of the, the people who write about screenwriting, including myself, are basically saying the same thing with little mm -hmm. tweaks here and there. Um, you know, uh, um, and it's really about whose version of eloquence do you, do you appreciate, I think. Right. Um, I, and I think, I think that, that, that understanding a model, I don't care whose it is, uh, you know, uh, a model is a very, very useful thing because that gives you a basis for your own thinking. And that also makes you think, if I'm going too far away from this, am I actually really going to be talking to the people I need to talk to? Uh, but using it as a kind of crutch is, is, is not what you want. Yeah, I was talking to a, um, a screenwriter the other day, and he told me that basically all stories are either three, three acts or, or four at the most. You can try to cut up a movie you can cut it up in eight acts. It's, yeah. it, it, it's irrelevant, because, but certain things 
that happen through into stories in popular films throughout history, without question, hit these marks mm -hmm. all the time. Even Pulp Fiction, which is out of order in the it's genius, very conventional. in the genius of that story and the way he wrote it and shot it and edited it, even though the stories are timelined off, the hits are happening at the points where they should be happening. So that's why it seems like an experimental film, but it's not. And it's so brilliant. That's what the brilliance of Pulp Fiction is. Yeah, I was going to say, that, that doesn't make it not clever. Uh, but yeah. it, but we have to understand what it is. Yeah, I, can, yeah, I, I totally agree. Yeah. yeah it, or it, something it, like uh, Memento or, yeah, I mean. Similar, Memento's yeah. another one. I mean, look, I mean, any, well, anything, Christopher Nolan, for God's sakes. I mean, he's always, you know, messing with time and everything in, in all, like in Inception and uh, Interstellar mm -hmm. and all of those things. But they all hit those marks. I mean, you, 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 that's why you look at a movie like um, any David any David uh, Lynch movie, uh -huh. <laughs> any David Lynch movie, they're not there, <laughs> they're all over the place, and that's why his films. You know, I think I think Blue Velvet was the closest. Maybe yeah. maybe Elephant Man, Eraserhead, possibly, but Blue Velvet's probably his most mainstream story. Why is also one of his most popular? But, uh, Mulholland Drive, like it's all like. Can you can you not can you can you pin those things on Mulholland Drive? I don't think you can. Not, not in terms of convention. No, I mean it's a loop, right? Literally, and as, as is, um, yeah. I mean, I think I think you know. The, but then when he's trying to be semi-conventional, like with Blue Velvet or like with uh, the original Twin Peaks, you know, yeah. he's doing that to ex to expose the conventionality as a, a as its own kind of artifice, right? So mm -hmm. I mean, he's not he's not being conventional. He's He's showing you that he's being conventional, uh, um, if you know. Right. Uh, exactly. But so so for, for everyone listening, so I just want you to kind of look like someone like Tarantino, who sometimes seems like he's unconventional. The genius of Tarantino is he's completely conventional within this unique structure that he's created and characters and, 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 and things that are strictly his. But when you look at someone like David Lynch, who's like, I mean, pinpoint a movie that has a conventional. It's very rare to find because he's making art films, and mm -hmm. that's okay. And that's okay as a as as a writer, as a director, you can do that. But if you're trying to sell to the studio system, you're trying to sell a conventional process. You need structure. You need to to pin. And I personally, when I write, I love structure because it gives me uh, goalposts to yeah. write. It, it makes me feel a lot more. It's like this is the this is the lane that I'm in. And I could play within this lane as much as I want, but I can't go off-roading. <laughs> right. I, I think that's extremely well put. I feel basically exactly the same. I always want to know that that I have some fallback, uh, some fallback questions to ask myself, uh, you know, uh, and, and to begin to kind of judge what I'm doing against. Unless I'm really, you know, I'm going off into the wilds of, of, of micro-budget fun. But that, having said that, one of the great things about the, the, the contemporary moment for screenwriters, and there are many not-so-great things, and we've kind of covered some of them already in mm -hmm. the discussion, is the fact that micro-budget is, is, is alive in a way that it never really was uh, mm -hmm. previously. And that, you know, you can be Shane Carruth and make a uh, primer for $7,000 or whatever he made it for. It, uh, uh, and you can be... Uh, you know, uh, um, a queer filmmaker or a woman or, or a person yeah. of color, you know, and, and be making stories that are deeply meaningful and, and radical without having to, you know, uh, deal with the system in many ways. I feel, um, I feel that this, I, I feel that the system is as we know it, because I mean, you and I both kind of grew up in this, I think we're a similar vintage, close enough to the vintages of, of our age. So we kind of grew up in the in the in the time when the system was the system, I remember when the you know Warner Brothers was putting out fifteen to twenty movies a year at some of them at five million dollars, maybe ten million dollar movies, you know, and then occasionally would have these big budget things. Where now it's just like everything's a big budget, everything, but it's all very calculated based on IP and yeah. things like that. They, they were taking chances. I mean, can you imagine Taxi Driver today? Can you yeah. <laughs> can you imagine Raging? I mean, Raging Bull maybe would get made, but well, well, Taxi Taxi Driver. You could make a version of Taxi Driver for ten bucks, and if you and that yes. version, you could make yeah, yeah, but within a studio system. No, no exactly. I, I, no I, way in hell that anything in the seventies would get made. Midnight Cowboy, I like. But, yeah. but I mean, but also all of the genre movies that I grew up with, right? Yeah. Uh, um, you know, John Carpenter and that oh, movie. Great. N name 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 any genre movie maker of the seventies, eighties, nineties. 
you know, a lot of that's gone. I mean, yes, there certainly is new iterations of things like the horror movie and Blumhouse and, you know, uh, and so on. And that's cool. Uh, but, but, you know, where is the sort of the, the mid-level genre movie? They, they, they kind of don't exist. Um, or at least there are very few of them. They're either really schlocky and kind of uh, uh, yeah. low budget or they need to be $300 million because, you know, one of the lessons that we learn uh, you know, is that the the B movies have become the A movie, and and so now those genres are are tentpole genres as opposed to being, you know, knockoffs. Um, right, and and, the, and then specifically, like you know, you could make a thirty million dollar genre piece mm -hmm. with John Carpenter directing back in the day, uh, and that was acceptable. Now you need Guillermo del Toro to make it, and it becomes an art piece and wins the Oscar. <laughs> you know, well, it, it's a. It, it, I mean, there's this horrible word niche, which which applies to like most of where indie has gone, right? Uh, in, mm -hmm. in, there's no longer indie, there's like niche or crossover or specialist. Uh, um, and then, you know, you're in this indie wood frame where you're kind of working in a, a very different notion of what independence is, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah the, the Sundance $3 million independent film, that's, yeah, with, with major stars attached who all took pay cuts. Yeah, that's not indie to me. Um, I, it's, and I'm glad that those movies are getting made because mm -hmm. they're, they're, telling, they're telling stories that might not get made, but, when I see them at Sundance, sometimes I'm like, really? Do you, mm. you got an Oscar winner in your movie. I know, yeah, sure, it costs you a million dollars to make and they, they're working for scale. But, you know, where are the, um, where are the Ed Burns, the Spike Lees, the Robert Rodriguez's, the Quentin Tarantino's, the Kevin Smith's of the world, all that 90s crop mm -hmm. of filmmakers? Where are they? None of those guys would even make it today and, if right. they were coming out. And I've, I've, and I've spoken to some of them and they, they said the same thing. I'm like, would you, would Brothers McMullen show up today? He's like, it never. It just wouldn't, wouldn't get the light of day. Right. Too much stuff going on in the, today's world. So it's a very interesting place we are in history. I, you know, I couldn't agree more. And, it, and it's a place that, that sort of weirdly, simultaneously, a place of more opportunities and way less opportunities. I mean, <laughs> it's a strange... A strange, you know, uh, um, scary mixture between the two. I think. Um, well, well, I think today, though, I think that before the barrier to entry was creation. Now, creation mm -hmm. is not the barrier to entry. Now, it's marketing. It's eyeballs. It's getting to an audience. It's getting seen. Is yeah. that's that's the art now? Where the creation of it used to cost so much, but now, like I made my last two features were made for under ten thousand, and I right. sold them to Hulu and internationally, because you know, and 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 they got sold. Uh, but that's that's the world we live in today. It's about that as well. And I think also with screenwriters, you know, the competition for screenwriters is. I think there's more opportunity now for writers than ever in history of Hollywood. So many shows. So yeah. many things going on. And streaming is fascinating. It's fascinating. Oh. Where it's going to be in five years, I don't know. But right now, it's it's genre breaking. It's there's a whole lot of really oh. interesting things going on. That's where all the independent filmmakers went. That's where all the independent writers went because they can't go anywhere. Well, else. Which is one of the reasons why I, I mean I'm not an expert on TV, but but it's one of the reasons why what's so fascinating to me from the outside about streaming is that all of these film people have gone into television. And they're trying to renegotiate what a series is, what an episode is, what what it means to write, you know, sequential narratives. Um, and the 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 breadth, the variety that we're getting, not all of it works, of course, but you know, it is 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 really fascinating. And I think that's something that that it, you know, is changing the model. And there's kind of a battle going on, it seems to me, between you know those shows that. Uh, are invested in the idea of the episode, and the episode is actually a good thing. The episode is something that you want to, to kind of cherish, um, you know, for its own purposes. Mm -hmm. And those who basically want to kill the episode dead and chop their long movie into, uh, you know, random thirty-minute, sixty-minute chapters, uh, you know, uh, and so so that the war for sequential narratives is ongoing and I'm, I'm very interested to see where it ends up. They basically is like, I want all the Harry Potter movie, all the Harry Potter books out now, as opposed to uh -huh. waiting little by little year after year, waiting for them to all come out is like, I want the whole story right now, or I'm going to value the episodes. Um, right. And there's, there's Netflixes and there's the Hulus of the world. Like I'm waiting for hands made's tale. And every week I'm like, Oh, right. I gotta wait. It's just horrible. You know, I'm, I'm so used to just like, binging everything um right. but it's a it's an interesting place we are without question now in your book you also talk about um mechanics and some mm -hmm. of the mechanics that screenwriters need to to learn what are some of those mechanics well i think uh, oh well there are many but of for course. me one of the keys is format um and i think one of the things that that certainly in my experience of my students one of the things that they 
often leave behind or feel a little bit frightened of is actually being creative with format and realizing that format on the page is something that isn't simply a chore, isn't simply a, a lesson to be learned, you know, slug line and description and, you know, um, character and dialogue. Uh, but once you get beyond that, it's something that you can uh, be very literary with, that you can be very stylistic, that you can own and that you can use as, uh, you know, a, 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 a creative tool. Um, and I think that's something that often students take more time to to come to terms with um uh because of course you know if you haven't written a screenplay before and you're trying mm -hmm. to think about the story and character development and all the good things that you have to do structure yeah. that kind of falls down the you know uh, um the, the the gap sometimes uh, so one of the things that i try and do uh, in the book a little bit but also you know in my classes is really to to show examples of format in different genres and different kind of styles and get them excited by how to use that creatively as opposed to it just being you know the the the, the chore to learn and then you do the basics and then you move forward um i mean that's just one example now can you talk also a little bit about um the the sea of white that most producers, the sea of white oh, yeah. on the on the page, they want to see as much white space as possible, yeah. and that descriptions are not novels, uh, and they have yes. to make those concise. I mean, there are lots of reasons for this. One of them that I'll mention up front, and I'll come back to exactly what you're talking about, is the the idea that you know when a a producer or certainly a reader is engaging with your script what is going to turn their blood cold, you know, particularly if you're some poor intern who's got 20 scripts to read, you know, is, is you know, like walls of text, both in dialogue and in, and in description. Uh, but also, you know, it, the idea is that what you want to try and do is replicate the style of the movie on, that will be on screen as much as you can in the way in which you, you set it up on the page. Uh, and sometimes that's about trying to anticipate things like kinesis, you know, movement, dynamism, action. So there are ways that you can play fast and loose with um, with grammar and syntax, and you can carry a sentence over, and we, we, you know, our eyes move are moving us through, and we're kind of getting excited and reading fast. And that sometimes is exactly what you want. But anyway, what you want to do, you know, in my opinion, is to think away from, you know, the big descriptive paragraph and to think more in what I call thought images. So the sense that you aren't calling shots unless you have to. Um, but what you're doing is implying shots by uh, describing something succinctly, eloquently, and then, then line of white, and then describing something else. And it's like what you're doing is effectively calling the shots through. We're looking at this, we're looking at this, this happens, this develops. And, and, and I think that's something that, you know, writers take a little bit of time to learn. That their instinct is to kind of, you know, describe what's on screen. And you, you end up with, you know, the wall of text that we all want to avoid. Um, but the idea of the thought image, the idea that what you're doing is trying to inspire readers, directors, actors, uh, uh, and give them every opportunity to kind of launch from your disposable pages, um, you know, and, and make them feel invested not only in the story and the abstract, but actually the style that you're implying that it will feel like once it's once it's on the screen that i think is really important and it's you know uh the joke i always make not really much of a joke but um you know is that when you have the director talking about their vision on a uh, late night uh talk show um uh you know there's the there's the the screenwriter w with his or her whiskey um shouting at the screen and saying that was my line you know um, <laughs> exactly so. but that's been going on since uh, the beginning oh, of, of i course. mean who was it was a jack warner or something like that that said that you know it, this movie this would be great if we could just get rid of the writers or something along those lines yeah, yeah. Well, I, I can't remember the exact quote but i but i know what you look yeah, yeah, yeah it's one but, of those things um no. now w one of the most difficult things i think to do as a writer is to develop a story out of an idea how what what advice would you have for that again you know i guess i would backtrack a little bit and i would say it depends what, where the idea comes from and it depends to a certain extent what what is the spark because sometimes the spark is a plot idea or a setting idea sometimes it's an image you get i mean i wrote a novel on writing novel, uh, that just began with an image uh, an image came to me and I was interested in that image and I began to ask questions about it and say, well, why is that person doing what they're doing? What, where is this? What's going on? Um, and sometimes it's, you know, a character. Uh, sometimes it's a situation. It's uh, something political with a small or a large P. Um, so so the, the idea can come from anywhere. 
And I think that your first job is to give that idea space and begin to interrogate it and ask it logical questions. And those logical questions are really story story telling questions. Um, because as soon as you ask, you know, here, here's my image. Well, okay, there's a character in that image. Who are they? What are they doing there? Uh, why, why are they feeling what they're feeling? Uh, what is the world around them? And so you begin to spy a diagram and kind of expand beyond. So that is the kind of the organic development process, right? You begin with some spark and then you begin to kind of ask it questions. The other process is, you know, I guess to kind of think cleverly about genres and hybridity and, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, log lines and, and think about, well, okay, if I, if I take this, this kind of horror movie, uh, but I add this kind of element, well, what does that become? And then I begin to expand it out and then I place a character in that world and I see, you know, what goes on. So there are, there are kind of, I guess there's top down, uh, uh, bottom up versions of, of story thinking. Uh, but this is really the only the beginning of it. Then I think, you know, you've got to decide, well, all right, who's my audience? Who is this for? Is this going to be a relatively conventional movie or am I kind of going somewhere way off on my own? Uh, either of which is entirely fine. Just deal with the consequences either way. Um, and the consequences of relatively mainstream is you need now to talk the language of development in your own thinking. Because even if you don't conceive of the world, I mean, you made the point about three acts and four acts a few minutes ago, and I, I agree with you completely. But even if that's not how you instinctively think, you need to be able to articulate your idea in those terms because that's how development thinks. Yeah, uh, you know, very uh, much so. And, uh, uh, and so I think it, it, it's you know, another reason why it's a good idea to have some uh, relatively coherent notion of conventional structure to fall back on is because you're going to have to explain it that way to someone who doesn't have magical insight into your creative brain, um, isn't an idiot, uh, um, uh, and does understand what they think story is and how it works. Uh, and you have to meet them halfway and be able to, to explain it. So this is a very good way, a very good reason to say, oh, no, you don't have to be formulaic, but you have to be able to talk to people who understand story in a certain way. And if you can do that, and if you can make your story work in that kind of frame, somebody will take the idea seriously in principle, whether they like it or not is another conversation. No. Um, in then you begin to get into models and so on. And then you begin to think about genres and what kind of genre is this? And, you know, genres come with their own histories and uh, uh, joys um, and also constraints, you know? Um, uh, and so all of these questions begin to put flesh on the, bone, on the bones. Um, and I think that unless you're running up against, the other thing, one thing I would say on this is unless you're running up against a really hard deadline, give yourself the luxury of time. Because I think... Uh, wherever your idea comes from and however you begin to conceive it in terms of, you know, genre and our audience and market and all these kind of pragmatic professional questions, um, the more time you give it, as long as you're being active with it and thinking about it, the more chance there is that you'll, you'll develop it organically rather than forcing it. Um, uh, you know, and a point comes where, you know, either you've got to, you know, shit, I get off the pot, right? I mean, you actually got to do something. With it. But, um, you know, I, I think, I've, I've always got two, three, four story ideas that are somewhere in the in the bubble of my cauldron mind, you know, uh, um, at different layers of, levels of cooking, um, whatever I'm working on. And that's also a really great thing to have as a writer because it means that you know you've got more than one idea. Uh, you know you have things to move on to. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you feel like you're part of an ongoing process of creative thought. And you aren't just, I have this one idea, this is all I know. If it fails, my life is over. You know, um, there was um, there was a, a movie I was watching the other day that um, which is going to lead into the question I'm going to ask you. I was watching a movie the other day, and I absolutely did not care in the least about the main character and what he was going through. And I was watching the movie, and I started just saying, you know what, I'm going to watch this to see where this goes because I'm curious on what the writers and the director, um, and the acting was good and had a nice cast to it. But no one, I, I couldn't grab onto anything that the, the, the main character, I didn't care. The yeah. only moment at all which fo I found interesting that I even remotely cared is when the main character was in some sort of real peril. Like they were going to go to prison because they were wrongly accused or something like that. But throughout the entire movie, there's no stakes for this yeah. character other than emotional stakes that I really didn't care about. It wasn't enough, enough to like hook onto. So what are some things that you like to see in main characters? Well, again, it comes down to this old writing cliche of needs, you know, that they need to need something. Um, and 
you know, I think the way I sort of conceive of story is, well, of, of narratives, is that, you know, you have story and you have plot. And, and plot are things we see on screen, the surface action and all the rest of it. And, pl- and story, you know, is, is the sort of motivational arc, right? It is uh, why characters do what they do. Uh, beyond the simply pragmatic, you know, someone shoots at me, I duck. But I think, um, you know, understanding needs in relation to story and plot, that would be the shorthand um, and theme. So if you don't have a coherent theme for your character, if they aren't trying to achieve something, trying to, you know, mend some break, get some advantage, uh, um, find the woman, man, horse of their dreams, and um, uh, uh, I think... I, I meant that in a in a girl and pony kind of way. Yeah, yes, yes, not in a oh, in a oh, weird way. <laughs> yeah, um, and um, you know, I think I think that's what gives stakes because then what you've done in your first act is you've established that you, this is a real person who has real flaws, wants, needs in the world, and you know they make a decision to go out and trying to achieve that, and that's something that we that we want to see. That's what the basis of a story is. Um, and it doesn't matter how plot-driven your story is. I mean, you can mm-hmm. think about some, a movie like, um, what was it called, 2012. Uh, that, mm-hmm. That's the, the Mayan history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, big, the, the big uh, world-crushing well, thing. Well, we yeah. go and see that movie. We go and see that movie because we want to, we want to see California fall into the sea, right? <laughs> it um, was, which it's is, a spectacle. It's, spectacle. It, exactly. But, but what holds the movie together is it's a story about, uh, 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 you know, some um, failing writer who can't keep his family together. So the story of the movie is about the John Cusack character, you know, trying to prove that he's not a deadbeat dad and he, he can get his family together. Do we care about that? No. Is that how the movie's sold to us? No. Um, but it, it's coherent and it's there, and that's the underlying narrative that holds the whole thing together and allows us to forget about it and enjoy California falling into the sea. Um, so even in very, very plot-driven movies, you need that sense of character coherence behind uh, the plotting. Otherwise, it's simply an exercise in stylistics. Right. Um, so, so a character like Indiana Jones, who right. could have who who could have been a very one dimensional character. I mean, because and because trust me, because after Indiana Jones came out, a lot of one dimensional copies of him showed up in other in other films. But the thing that the theme, not the, I don't know if it's a theme, but the need behind Indiana Jones is that he wants to protect archaeology ar- archaeological. Um, treasures and they be- they belong in a museum. They belong in a museum, and he fights for that. If he was just a treasure hunter, or if he was just a grave draw- a robber, which so many of his copies were, they fall flat. But because right. of that one little tweak in the character, that there's a real earnestness about why he's doing what he's doing. That's what drives his character. I, I could not agree more, uh, and this is why you know. M- what wonderful as some of the um, uh, um, Tomb Raider uh, uh, yeah. books are, uh, books of games are books. Um, yeah. uh, you know that's why they don't work as movies because you don't have that kind of investment. But the other thing, of course, that the Indiana Jones has is a, a really engaging B story, right? A really engaging oh, yeah. romantic story. Yep, yep. Where we see that he's basically an asshole, <laughs> uh, but but also he, you know, he will sacrifice himself to save. Marion. You know, um, Marion. And yeah. of course, not that Marion always needs saving, right? I mean, this is one of the joys of the movie is that Marion sure. can kick ass. Yes. Um, you know, so so she can meet him on his own ground, which is, which is you know, cool. Or at least, you know, they, they, they sell her out a little bit here and there. But basically. Sure. She, and, uh, but the whole, but the whole, the whole, let's go, let's, let me, looking at Raiders, the whole thing has so many different layers, so many different things going on, subplots, other storylines, you know, making Indiana Jones, who is essentially a superhero of its of his day, his kryptonite is snakes and how hilarious that is and yeah. giving him a weakness like that um throughout the piece and all of these things it's great and then like looking at last crusade mm. where the thing that brings him like kind of like weakens him is his father and his relationship yeah. with his father yeah. julia yeah. it's oh so brilliant gosh um yes okay. <laughs> please That's please okay. continue with your sean connery sir <laughs> oh, no. oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, uh, that's that's all you get. But uh, I guess, when, by the way, when I was growing up, you know, if, if you're a kid in England in the in, in school in the seventies, you didn't have a bad Michael Caine, and you didn't have a bad Sean Connery. You were no sure. one. So obviously, obviously. Yeah. Um, uh, well, oh yes, Indiana Jones. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, and this is also the way in which, uh, you know, its own intertext, right, going back, this is how you land the bit or not, um, um, uh, its own intertext as, you know, uh, uh, um, an adventure movie, a kind of um, homage to serials, um, you know, all of, all of the other genres that kind of come in, you know, um, it is so wonderful because every, each one you do allows you to do a different thing, allows you to add another element to it. Um, and also, you know, I, but I think we were talking about, um, you know, uh, um, uh, style and, and a style of writing and how that, you know, it plays, uh, you know, on screen. One of the things that, of course, makes Indiana Jones also so real is the fact that you don't have digital um, stuff. Effects. Yeah, effects. Uh, yeah. That you have people who are actually getting dragged behind trucks and all the rest of it. And it may be somewhat less, uh, uh, you know, dynamic than you know uh, the Avengers, a movie which I admire in the same way. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but you know, you feel that he's been through hell to get where he's going. Um, so not only is, has he sort of emotionally had to deal with things, and not only has he has deal with his integrity and the fact that you know Nazis, I hate those guys, uh, mm -hmm. but also you know you 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 can feel how he's been beaten up mm -hmm. uh, all the way through the movie, and and it feels like it feels real in a way. But it feels real in a way that most movies made in the last 20 years never do. Right. And even when that showed up, it was something that really people were just completely blown away by because it was just something you've never seen before. One thing I, I, that I really love to hear your opinion on is mixing of genres. When, mm. you co when you collide genres, that's where some really interesting things happen. So, you know, Star Wars or let's... It's let's really getting employed, by the way. That's a... a what has to do? Exactly. Sorry. So, yeah. so let's let's combine something very contemporary, Mandalorian, which is a spaghetti western meets a, a, a sci-fi film. That is, it's not a sci-fi film by itself. It's not a spaghetti western by itself. It is a mixed genre, uh, and because of it, it allows for so many different tropes and things that you couldn't do in its own, if they were just two separate, there's things that you can't do in a spaghetti Western that you can do in Mandalorian. And there's things in the Mandalorian yeah. you could do you can't do in a sci-fi, a standard sci-fi film. Right. I mean, you know, thinking about the history of screenwriting, one of the great uh, uh, interventions that, that the first Star Wars made is the idea of centering uh, at least some genres around the potential of hybridity, right? I mean, this is the thing. That, you know, Star Wars was a samurai movie, Star Wars was a Western, Star Wars was a science fiction movie, and so it's serial, and la, la, la. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, and this is, you know, to the nth compared to what we were talking about with Indiana Jones. Um, so that sense in which hybridity has become increasingly central as opposed to um, uh, occasional uh, mm -hmm. in genre making is, is a really, really important idea. And one that, you know, if your, if your pitch, um, if your movie, if your spec uh, has an interesting hybridity to it is actually much more likely to get read seriously and 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 taken yeah, on. Uh, yes, yeah, a sci-fi romance yeah. um, is more interesting than a romance. Like, uh, oh god, the great movie Somewhere in Time with you Chris know I've heard of seen that. Christopher Reeve and oh, yeah. eons ago. So eons more... ago, I think it came out in like eighty, but that was a a back in time romance sci-fi film, but it took place in like. Victorian times, if I remember correctly, or the wet, something like that. But it was it was a romance sci-fi. I mean, Back to the Future, right? Or a film that I love, Lady Hawk. Um, oh, of course, right? You know, uh, well, so exactly. Um, no, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I think, but I think that this is one of the great things about the current generation of of potential writers is that they think hybridity and almost instinctively now. Mm -hmm. Um, they grew up I it. have so much, it's almost one of the things I don't have to teach in my classes. I'm not that you teach it exactly, but you know, uh, because my, my students are coming from video games and they're coming from comic books and they're coming from, uh, you know, everything that's going on, you know, you know and, and YouTube and the media and TikTok and who knows what stuff that I, I wouldn't know because I'm too old. Um, you know, and I think that, that they're already doing half of that thinking. Um, uh, and that's very encouraging, but yes, I mean, I think that, that this is right. One way of thinking about it, though, is what is your lead genre and what and, and what is the, the the hybrid genre and how are they colliding? So a, a, an example of that I would take would be the, the first Alien, Alien movie, Alien, oh. um, which, which you know opens as a, as a as a science fiction movie. We're we're in a science fiction movie. We're on a spaceship. People are waking up. They're figuring out what the hell's going on. And then it becomes obviously an old dark house film. It becomes you know here's the monster chasing us through the house, and the, the horror comes into it. But the lead is science fiction. And that I think is important to understand, 
you know, what the, the hierarchy, I mean, the most important part of, of, of Alien is, is the horror, um, is the, the nature of the alien being and its stages and its abilities. But, um, you know, it's sold as a science fiction movie in which these other things happen. So thinking about what, what genre leads and what genres, you know, uh, um, infest it. But also thinking also not just about hybridity in terms of mixing two or more genres, uh, um, up front, but also the idea of mode and the idea that there are times in a movie where another kind of genre can bleed in, infest it, and then kind of go out again. So if you think of a movie like um, um, Silence of the Lambs, right, which is a procedural, right? Yeah. Um, and um, uh, But there are moments when it absolutely invests itself in horror. But those moments come and go. Um, yeah, so, you know, for example, when Lecter, spoilers, when Lecter you know, escapes and, and we think that, that he's injured some cop very badly and they're in the back of the ambulance and he sits up and takes the oh, face. Oh, you know? so good. Great, not only a coup de, coup de cinema, a great moment, but also that's like, that's modal, right? That's a moment where another genre goes, whoop, and then back down again, as opposed to being the constant, um, right. you know. Um, like Alien, like Alien would be like yeah, a constant. Kind of, yeah. Yeah, and then and then of course Cameron took Aliens to another level where it took horror, action, sci-fi, and war. Right. And they, he jammed right. those all together. And I think Cameron specifically, who oddly enough, Cameron doesn't get the credit that he deserves as a writer because he's mm -hmm. so well known as a director, being one of the most prolific, you know, and you know most popular directors of all time. But his genres, the way he combines genre and all Titanic true lies um i mean from the beginning from terminator he's combining genres and themes that you know the is is pretty remarkable like in terminator i mean be, i mean there's a few things going on in terminator between science fiction action the um I, almost like the immaculate conception idea you know like yeah. he's got a lot of stuff going on but he's been doing that throughout his career in almost every movie and I, when I talk to when I talk to some uh, uh, some very popular uh, uh, screenwriters, Cameron is one that always pops up when I talk to them. They go, "Yeah, it's just James, man. Jim knows how to do this, or Jim does that." And like Avatar, I mean, I just love to talk to you real quickly about Avatar because he gets yeah. so much crap. A lot of a lot of other writers, they're like, "Oh, it's so this or so that," but yet, yet he was able to combine. You know, it's basically dances with wolves meets Fern Gully uh, and, and jammed in those two ideas and then jammed in a bunch of other things as well. But the way he presented the story, mm -hmm. it touched a chord in humanity because it's still the biggest movie of all time. Twelve years or whatever long later, it's still holding <laughs> strong in the era of Avengers, which it did beat of Avatar for a minute, but then Avatar got re-released and it took over <laughs> Avengers again, you know, but it's, it's remarkable with Cameron and Avatar. Like what, how would you analyze that? Because it is, it, it's, you know, it's, it, I can't say it's paint by numbers because it's not, it's, it's this, it deceives, it's, it, you, you are deceived by its simplicity, but yet the complexity behind it. Well, I think, I guess where I come in is, I, I think it's two thirds of a genius movie and then the last third. Um, in other words, uh, it, it feels like all of the things that invested me and engaged me, the cleverness, both in, you know, I mean, again, as you say, it's not, in some ways, it's not the most complex film in the world, but, but the, 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 the cleverness of the Avatar system and oh. the building of the relationships and all this kind of stuff, which, um, you know, half of me is going, yes, 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 I get the, I get where this is coming from and how this is working, but it works. And, but. You know, that setup I found genuinely engaging and interesting. I like the world of Navi and, and, and oh, the rest yeah. of it. Yeah. Uh, but, but then it kind of defaults to an action movie. Um, yeah. And the then, end. you know, there are, uh, 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 you know, the, the humans just fall into cliche and it's so obvious that I have to hate them and, and, and you know, all the rest of it. I, and I kind of lose interest. It's well done. I mean, it's amazingly, you know, as a piece of, of spectacle, it's very effective. Um, you know, flying around those those hover ships and all the rest. Mm -hmm. of it. Um, uh, it, but but I, I kind of lose interest because it, it, it where hybrid the hybridity kind of the balance of the genres uh, went away from me, um, when, and I but, just began to feel that I that, that that it I was less interested towards the end. But when you see you see a film like Avatar or you know or uh, like even if you go back to Aliens, it's not a complex story. These stories are not. 
like mind turners. They're not like a Nolan film, but they're executed to almost perfection. It's kind of like making a chocolate chip cookie. The recipe is not complex. Most people could do it, but when you execute it perfectly, it's the best chocolate chip cookie ever. <laughs> right. And it's also a film that back in, you know, if we think back 20 years ago, it's a film that actually used 3D creatively and well. Oh. You know, uh, so I yes. mean, this is not, in one sense, this has nothing to do with storytelling. In another sense, it's everything to do with storytelling, you know. Right. Um, that, you know, that there have been these, you know, more recent experiments and with, with, with 3D and that we're okay and whatever. And then I remember sitting in the cinema and watching the uh, Avatar in 3D and going, oh, oh no. okay, this is different. Yeah. This is, this is, this is. This is not like these other things. You know? Well, it's um, like when Hugo, when, when Scorsese did Hugo, he used yeah, yeah. 3D yeah, yeah. purposefully and with design and yeah. style. And it's not just converted. It, yeah. it was designed that way. And I saw, I only saw Avatar in the theater in 3D. Like I've never seen it in the theater without the 3D aspect. And it's yeah. arguably when the only movie I enjoyed in 3D. Honestly. Yeah, well, it, it, exactly. This is kind of what I'm saying. That, that I'm all for 3D when, when it actually becomes, you know... Uh, uh, even radically part of the, the aesthetic. And I think it kind of did in, in Avatar. Um, uh, you know, when well, it simply becomes an excuse to charge me 10 bucks more for my seat, I, I'm not interested in it, you know. Um, and, I and I think the new Avatars are going to be, honestly, the thing that brings people back to the theaters. It's going to be a spec... Next summer. Next summer. Next, next summer or next winter, I think it comes out. 2022 it comes out. But then they're coming out every two years after that or every year after that because he's got all four of them in a row. Right. But um, but I think that would be the film that brings people because I I don't want to see that at home. Like there's certain yeah. films I don't want to see at home. I want well, to get that spectacle. Well, but this I mean this brings us. I, I couldn't agree with you more again. But this brings us back to the the big un, un, unknown, right? The what is the future of of cinema as an institution as a, a, a you know, an opportunity to sell me popcorn? Um, <laughs> and and I think obviously the uh, um, 3D was seen as being, uh, you know, a life extender. And uh, is it still, you know, where are we going to be? I don't have an answer to that. Where are we going to be in two, four, six, ten years' time? Uh, you know, are we going to have a, a few cinemas to show us specialist movies, or are we really going to have a, a healthy exhibition sector? You know, I, I, I wonder. I think, uh, I personally, my opinion is that it's going to go the way of Broadway. I mean, plays were the only thing for a while, but now um, plays are expensive things that you go to and they're spectacle and they're high productions and things like that. And I think in 30 or 40 years, seeing an independent film at a cinema, mm. you know, or seeing a comedy or seeing it, you know, is, is going to be rare and rare and rare because of the way, it's just the way it is. But but I don't think it will die. I just think it will it's going to be spectacle and there might be art house things like, like there's like there's off Broadway or there's like, yeah. you know, plays somewhere else. There'll always be some form of it. Just like plays are still, there's no reason to go see a play, I mean, but people do see it because it's enjoyable. I, it's a different form of, of art. Right. I, I mean, I guess, I guess the, I mean, my instinct, I think, I think I'm, I, I, I largely agree with what you said. I mean, the, the other side of it is the question is where does that, where does that social interaction go? You know, where, where do kids go on dates? Where does it, where, where what becomes the replacement for cinema as a social activity? Is uh, it ready? Is it ready player one? Is that what it is? <laughs> no, but like, is that you and I can't conceive of it because we didn't grow up with it, but my yeah. daughters are coming up and they're playing roadblocks or, or, you know, or world of Warcraft yeah. or things like that, where Warcraft, but yeah, you're in the digital space. And then that gets into a whole conversation with like why are people buying NFTs and why are people, you know, it, it's, it's a different yeah. mindset completely than what we're used to in the analog world. No, you're right. I mean, I mean, absolutely. And, and you know, I'm, I'm in World of Warcraft, I'm in the guild, I'm ready to do these things. So obviously, that social space is something I'm familiar with. Uh, and yet, you know, I think I think that the, the, that sense of, of the virtual versus the real, you know, where, where, where do a gender A and gender B or both genders the same, uh, um, end up where they can where they where they can be 14 and, and, and touch each other and make out in the back row. Uh, you know, uh, I agree. Yeah. I, I don't know where that's going to be. And it might be movies still, but it might be, it might be, it might be something else. Oh, I totally um, agree. I mean, that's the interesting question, right? Uh, so uh, I guess all I'm saying is that's my, that's my big unknown as far as uh, the future of the future of exhibition. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So let me ask you, what are three screenplays every screenwriter should read? Uh, yeah, this is one of the questions that if you said, if you sent me this one before, I might've had, you know, 
Um, really interesting question. Um, okay, let me try and find a quick answer. Um, uh, 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 um, Butch and Sundance. Yep, comes up often. Um, Goldman, of course. Yeah. Um, anything by Bergman. I know it's in translation, but just anything by Bergman. Uh, and Alex Cox's Repo Man. Oh, I love Repo Man. Oh. Under a certain definition of my favorite film, that's my favorite film. Repo, uh, Repo Man is one of those films. That ones. film that, that, that deals with hybridity radically. Oh, Jesus does it. I mean, that's, I mean, look at um, They Live. Oh. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh, oh, God, that just the fight scene alone is worth the price of admission. <laughs> Rowdy Roddy Piper, yeah. Oh, Rowdy Roddy, right. rest in peace, sir. Um, now, yeah, what ad what advice would you give a screenwriter wanting to break into the business today? Um, again, uh, great question, tricky one. I think it, it well, part one, it depends on what you mean by the business. Uh, if you mean Hollywood, if you mean big big budget movies, um, then you know it's about uh, uh, having enough experience that you can you know you can really write a screenplay yeah you haven't just managed to struggle through one you've got you've written two three four you actually have that set of skills as a writer and you're flexible um second is that um you are an entrepreneur you need to be an entrepreneur you need to be able to talk to people you need to be the cliche good in a room you need to be someone who has the guts and the um you know the arrogance without being a dick ideally um to to be able just to go and talk to someone you have to be able to make connections. You have to be able to to, to build relationships because it's still a relationship-driven business, mm -hmm. um, you know, which kind of means that you know you can be a writer, you can be successful and not live in LA, mm -hmm. but to, be, to start as a writer, it's I think that's trickier not to be in LA. Um, I look. I'm from someone who. What do you mean by starting? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, no. Uh, from someone who lived outside of LA for a long time, and I've been here for 13 years now. Um, I, I get that. I understand it. Is it possible to do it outside of LA? Yes. No question. There's other places that have a lot of production in the United States. Um, and if you're outside of the United States, you know, London and other, other places within each country has, but, uh, but LA does something as, this, as of this recording, because there's an exodus right now, <laughs> as, as of this recording, there's an exodus out of California, um, that you learn here at a quicker pace because you're working at a, with people at a higher level than you would outside this market. And it's not because they're better or worse, it's just because they just do it so often that you just get that experience much faster. Like I learned more in the first year I was here than in five years of living in Florida doing the business. It's just it's just that kind of thing. And the connections are here. The yeah. connections are here. You, you, and, and, even if, and even if you take the route of, you know, starting as a PA and whatever else and just, and just getting the experience of being on sets and meeting people, you know, you're, you're gonna meet people, you're gonna meet producers, you're gonna meet people who are, who are at a level that when they want to help you, they can help you. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, by the way, the worst thing, of course, you can do is, is turn up the first day and was on, a, on a shoot and talk to the producer and hand them your screenplay. But, yeah, don't, but, don't do don't, that. Don't, don't, don't. But, um, you know, <laughs> when you have a relationship and then the point will come where they will say, what have you got? That's different. The only the way I always tell um, young filmmakers and writers about making connections and stuff is, and I'm sure you have this experience as well, we can smell desperation coming from a mile away. It is a very bad scent and you can smell it if you're a professional who've been in this business for a while. So when somebody just wants, I need from you, I need from you, I need from you, I need you, I need to, and you need to do something for me, that energy, you can smell it in a heartbeat. Whereas the opposite is where you go, how can I be of service to you? How mm -hmm. can I help you? And it could be something super simple, could be more complex, and you start building relationships that way because that's how friendships are built. Exactly. I mean, and listen, I mean, I think, again, I think you've hit the nail on the head. I and mean, what I would say is that, that to some people who are listening to this, that might sound like he's being cynical. He's not being cynical um, because, you know, it, it's about building a human relationship, which is based on trust and respect. Mm -hmm. And, the, you know, frankly, if you meet somebody higher up in the industry, there's nothing they really want from you. Uh, uh, in what, terms do you of, what do you have to offer Steven Spielberg? Right. Other than your willingness to be human, helpful and uh, 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 yeah, I mean, and I, be enough I, service. And I promise you that is very valuable because at, when you meet people at that level, when you can connect with them at a human level authentically, that mm -hmm. is rare in their world.
because everybody's always trying to imagine yeah. being Steven Spielberg. Imagine walking in for the last 30 years to every room you walk into, every eyeball's on you because you know you're a, you're a kingmaker. You can literally just go, you, you now shall direct, you, mm -hmm. you shall write. And with one touch of his hand, it's your 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 the door opens can you stay there is up to you but the door opens opportunities open and i've and i've had the pleasure of speaking to, to people who and by the way spielberg has touched so many careers so many careers it's uh, he's one of the most giving people in this business but can you imagine being him <laughs> walking around with that I, well exactly but I mean, it's like this, that, that everyone in Hollywood or the industry uh, knows that every relationship is in some sense contingent. It's some in some sense, in some way. So, you know, given that you need to try as hard as you can to be as human as possible, you know, uh, so that, that, that that's not what you're thinking about when you're engaging with someone. Well, that's not what they're thinking about. Right. Uh, and if, you know, if people like you and they want to help you, they'll help you. Yeah. And also time. It takes Most time. People are great. Most, I'm sorry. Yeah. And it takes time and it's yeah. not going to happen in six months. I've had, I had relationships with people for three or four years before I even asked them for anything or before they even offered anything because I learned that along the way. Whereas when I was younger, I would walk on the set with the script <laughs> or the idea. I'm like, Hey, can I have your card? I got this thing. It's going to be worth it. I mean, I, I've been there. <laughs> of course you did because it's the law, right? I mean, we all did. <laughs> And I say this, you know, about myself. when you're young and you're an asshole, and you don't know. I mean, this is the, you know, I mean, that, with all due respect. But yeah, you know, sure. But yes, I mean, this is exactly the exactly the thing. Yeah, without uh, question. Uh, but this, I'm, I'm just saying, this, this, this is definitely something I'm going to show all my uh, all my students because what you said there is is you know so important. Yeah, and I and I and, and it's I appreciate that because I I I talk to filmmakers and screenwriters on a daily basis, and I talk to the most experienced, and I've talked to the most na you know naive and delusional. Uh, it, it, of our species, and uh, and um, it's there's nothing worse than a delusional filmmaker who thinks that they're. I always come like I always pretend to be this delusional filmmaker, and I'll say, when why hasn't Hollywood knocked on my door? Why haven't they recognized my genius? I don't they understand that I am the next Tarantino or the next Nolan or the next Fincher? Don't they get it? Why haven't they just seen my short film and just automatically just given me a check? Why hasn't Sundance? allowed me into their their little festival when they should be recognizing my talent. These are these are serious conversations I've had with filmmakers who are and, and screenwriters too who are they just think because they wrote something that they're owed someone to read it. Yeah. That's not the way the game works, guys. At all. Uh, yeah, and I'm sure you yeah, deal with it yeah. on a daily basis. I have nothing to add to that. That is, that is <laughs> that's it in a nutshell. No, I mean that's yes. Yeah. <laughs> and um finally last question Three of your favorite films of all time. I know Repo Man is on the top of that Repo list. Man, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the Wicker Man, the original, the original Wicker Man. You mean the, 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 the Nicolas Cage, obviously the genius no, Nicolas Cage film. Yeah. The, the bees, the bees. No, no, not, no, avoid, avoid. Um, <laughs> the Wicker Man, the original is a work of genius. Uh -huh. And, uh, okay, we mentioned Bergman, um, um, The Virgin Spring. Okay, the great, Bergman. great choices. And can we all agree that Nicolas Cage is a national treasure uh, yes. and, 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 should be, yeah. and should be treated as such? And should be put on Mount Rushmore or wherever. wherever, wherever oh, it is. but uh, what? Yeah. A, oh, I'm dying to have I, I'm dying to have him on my show one day, or at least just get to speak to him one day, right? Right. Because he is, I just love him and everything. <laughs> With you, I think he, I think he's terrific. I think he's he's, he's awesome. Um, and you know what I love about him? And this is now we're going on a side on a side yeah. a side thing here. But what yeah. I love about guys like Nick. It, like I know him, <laughs> Mr. Cage, um, yeah. is that they take swings at the bat. Mm -hmm. When they get on bay, when they get up to the to, to the the, batter, the batter's box, they take big monstrous swings, and you need artists to take swings. Like Nolan, Nolan takes massive swings when he shows up to bat. You know, there's the safe bunters and the first base hits, and but then there's these guys that just show up, and if they swing and they strike out, they take the hits. You right. know. And that's the kind of artist I'd like well, to watch. And that, and that, which is why you keep them on the roster because you know that next time they're gonna, you know, they're the they're the big giant guys that just like if they catch one. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm trying to make a segue to cricket here, but I just don't know how. I can it, do this that. is I I don't know. It, it's exactly yeah. As best I can with baseball, I, I've had a few uh, I've had a few Brits who just like 
I'm with you. If it was soccer, excuse me, football, uh, it would be <laughs> it'd be one thing. It'd be cricket, but you get the idea. <laughs> I, I totally get the idea. Yeah. <laughs> Julian, it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you. I know we could probably talk for another hour. Um, where can people find out more about you and, and uh, look look up your books? Well, um, they exist on Amazon. I don't have a, a, a functional website right now, um, but hopefully that will emerge soon. Um, it, but I'm on faculty at San Francisco State University in the School of Cinema. That's where I, I, I do my teaching, um, and you can find out more about me there. Great. And I'll put links to uh, all of that in the show notes. Julian, thank you so much for uh, for sharing your knowledge bombs with the tribe today, sir. My pleasure.